Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. This has been a very productive week already, and I'm looking forward to the G7 ministerial here in Bonn. First, I'd like to thank Minister Lindner for his leadership. I've spent the week in Warsaw and Brussels before arriving here in Bonn. The backdrop for this trip, of course, is Russia's illegal and unprovoked war against Ukraine. And my thoughts continue to be with the people of Ukraine as they fight back against Putin's brutal invasion into their homeland. I was honored to join and hear from refugees who have been welcomed to Poland. They were generous enough to share their experiences and they embodied the strength of the Ukrainian people. Treasury is committed to doing what we can to ensure that Putin's brutal war continues to be met with fierce resistance internationally. The United States and more than 30 of our partners representing well over half the world's economy have imposed unprecedented financial pressure measures on Russia and its leadership. We are firm in our resolve to hold Putin accountable and to strengthen the hand of the Ukrainian people as the invasion continues. Thanks to this unity, the sanctions imposed against the Russian Federation have already had enormous impact. Russia is experiencing recession, high inflation, acute challenges in their financial system, and an inability to procure the material and products they need to support their war or their economy. Over the next two days, I'll work with my G7 counterparts to ensure we continue to stand together to uphold our shared principles and extend our cooperation to boosting our support for Ukraine. I expect that the Senate will respond to the President's request and pass a package of $40 billion in security, economic, and humanitarian aid soon. In Bonn, I'll ask my G7 counterparts to join us in increasing their financial support to Ukraine. Ukraine has done remarkable work to repel Russia's invasion, but they need our help and they need it now. Zooming out though, Russia's war against Ukraine has exacerbated the issue of food security for people around the world, particularly in emerging and developing countries. I'm deeply concerned by how this is unfolding. There's a very real risk that soaring global market prices of food and fertilizer will result in more people going hungry, further exacerbate price pressures, and harm government fiscal and external positions. At my direction, international financial institutions, including the IMF and World Bank, have developed an action plan to address this threat. These IFIs have started surging billions in resources. For example, the World Bank is mobilizing over $1.9 billion and details were announced earlier today. This has been important progress, but we need to double down on our efforts to ensure that people around the world can feed their families. Finally, it's no secret that I'm keenly focused on moving forward on the, on the global agreement on international tax reform, including a global minimum tax that will level the playing field and raise crucial revenues to benefit people around the world. Last fall, 137 countries, representing nearly 95% of the world's GDP, agreed on a deal that will stabilize our tax systems, provide resources to invest in security, and respond to crises like COVID-19, and ensure that corporations fairly share the burden of financing government. I know my counterparts in the G7 share my sense of urgency, and I look forward to discussing the next steps with them. And with that, let me stop, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. 
global economy, and what can you and your counterparts here at ACE uh, do to help avert a global recession? Well, uh, certainly the economic outlook globally is challenging um, and uncertain, and higher food and energy prices are having stagflationary effects, namely depressing output and spending and raising inflation all around the world. Um, the United States in many ways is best positioned, I think, to meet this challenge given the strength of our labor market and economy. But we're working, we understood um, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine and we decided to respond that there would be spillover effects and that we are prepared to pay to pay. But we're doing everything we can to make sure that the sanctions have the minimum negative impact on ourselves, on Europe, on other countries, emerging markets, developing countries, and the maximum impact on Russia. And many of the discussions we have had and will continue to have as we continue to put sanctions in place um, will be about how best to design them to shield the global economy from the adverse effects while imposing maximum harm on Russia and Putin. And of course, um, specifically with respect to oil prices, um, the president announced uh, jointly with other partners, um, in, in our case, releases, large releases of a million barrels um, a day of oil from the strategic petroleum reserve that I think is helping to um, stop oil prices from rising even further and giving a window in which supply can ramp up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Secretary Yellen. Chris Conner from Bloomberg News. Um, in recent months, Secretary Yellen, the U.S. dollar has appreciated significantly against many other currencies. And part of that is, of course, an, a natural result of the expectation for higher interest rates in the U.S. But the extent of that strengthening has surprised and even alarmed some market participants and some governments. Um, could you assess um, if that strengthening were to continue, how worried would you be on two levels? First, about the U.S. Uh, domestic economy, given its potential impact on export manufacturers, and also on the many countries around the world that carry significant levels of dollar-denominated debt. Would you be worried about it provoking a debt crisis? And Finally, um, would, you, would the administration advise that anything could or should be done about this scenario? Thank you. So let me say from the standpoint of the administration, we're committed to a market-determined exchange rate, although we've made clear that um, actions that countries specifically take to push down the value of their currencies in order to distort trade in their favor, that we will respond to that. But we have a market-determined exchange rate and think that's the best regime. Um, I think you pointed to one factor, tighter monetary policy in the United States, rising interest rates that is um, causing capital to uh, flow toward the United States and into dollars. Um, also, at a time of kind of risk off and uncertainty, it's natural the dollar is a global safe haven and we tend to experience inflows um, naturally that push up the dollar in highly uncertain economic times. So I think it's understandable that the dollar um, has risen. But um, you pointed to impacts on other countries and that is a concern. There are uh, many countries with dollar-denominated uh, debt, and a rising dollar makes it more difficult uh, for countries to bear that debt. Um, we know that often emerging markets um, worry about how they will fare in an environment of um, higher interest rates and tightening monetary policy. I saw that myself when I was Fed chair, and we began to tighten. And um, I think continuing to keep our neighbors well informed 
Um, it's the Fed, of course, runs an independent monetary policy, but um, attempting to be clear about what our policy is, I think, is an important uh, strategy for helping our neighbors um, adjust. Wait. You've spoken before about the possibility of Russian central bank reserves being used to fund, to defend um, Ukraine, and to um, to rebuild the country. And you've also spoken about how there would be a need between counterparts uh, to do so. Can you elaborate a bit on some of the conversations that have been had um, regarding that, that possible effort with the Russian central bank? And also, could you talk a little bit about what sanctions options are left available and what are some of the the most severe that could be imposed and when they would potentially be imposed? So with respect to the assets of the Russian Central Bank, they're obviously substantial. Um, I think the United States and our partners, it's estimated, have blocked around 300 billion of those assets. And I think it's very natural that given the enormous destruction in Ukraine and huge rebuilding costs that they will face, that we all look to Russia to help pay at least a portion of the price that will be involved. Um, that said, while we're beginning to look at this, it would not be legal um, now uh, in the United States for the government to seize those statutes. It's not something that is legally permissible in the United States. Other countries have, um, you know, legal issues around it as well. And there really are a number of issues. Um, conversations are really just beginning among countries about how to finance longer term reconstruction and whether or not those assets should play a role, and if so, how. So I don't really have a, a lot further news for you on that. Um, Annette Weiss, back with CNBC. I have a question on inflation for you again, because inflation um, also in the United States, but here in Europe is yeah, starting to potentially get out of control. So how concerned are you about that? And is that one reason why you are floating the idea of having tariffs on uh, oil exports from Russia and not an outright ban from the European Union? Thank you. Um. So inflation clearly is a concern in many parts of the world, in the United States, in the UK, and um, in, in the rest of Europe as well. And clearly, higher energy prices, higher food prices are, and you know, other commodity prices, really due to Putin's choice to launch um, a war in Ukraine against Ukraine, are really responsible for much of that. And we understood that there would be consequences that we would not be able to shield ourselves entirely from economic consequences. But the principle that um, all of us um, have adopted um, as we consider what sanctions packages to adopt are, as I said, we want to have the maximum impact we can on Russia, the maximum negative impact to degrade their ability to wage war now and project power in the years ahead, and to minimize the negative spillovers to ourselves. And as we contemplate um, energy sanctions and other sanctions, this is always the core of the conversations that we've had. So. Um, the European Union has made clear that uh, they intend to um, end oil imports over the next, um, by the end of this year. That gives a significant amount of time to make sure that it can be done in an orderly way and so that there won't be price spikes associated with it. And in the meantime, discussions are ongoing. Um, all of us share the objective of 
diminishing the revenues that Russia will have um, to buy goods and services that will help their economy and enable them to wage war. And we're doing a lot of things that are effective in diminishing their access to the goods and services that they need. Um, just very recently, it was announced that um, the two major tank producing firms have had to shut down operations because of inability to get necessary parts and um, materials. But um, shutting off oil and gas revenues are a very substantial source of revenues for Russia. We would like to do what we could to diminish uh, those um, revenues going to Russia. And so a number of ideas have been discussed. And, you know, you've probably heard tariffs, um, price caps, other possibilities that are on the table. And we continue to look at those things. No decisions have been made. Um, you know, this is important for Europe to um, decide what they think is best. But we continue to have those discussions. And there are a lot of options. But those are the objectives. Um, we've seen uh, continued increases in gas prices. Can you talk a little bit about when uh, Americans can see relief from the administration's actions and um, if you would anticipate the problem will get worse before it gets better this summer? So, um, you know, I'm not going to try to forecast the exact path of gas prices for you, but um, the global price of oil is um, stabilized, you know, Brent around a little bit over $100. And, you know, of course, that means um, higher gas prices than Americans want. And um, we've seen in some time, um, I think as supply begins to ramp up, we expect to see a significant supply response in the United States and other parts of the world. In the meantime, the releases from the strategic um, petroleum reserve, I think, are serving to basically stabilize um, prices. Um, and so we're doing what we can to avoid further increases in energy prices. But, um, you know, we also want to make sure that um, we wean um, the Europe, especially, um, weans itself from dependence on um, reliance on Russia for oil and gas. And um, these pressures are, you know, not likely to abate in the very near future. Hi, thanks, Secretary. Um, yesterday, you, you called for uh, an uh, allies to sort of uh, confront China together. Um, how concerned are you about the lockdowns that are going on in China right now, uh, you know they are the the producer for the world. Um, how how big of a threat is this to the global economy? What will you discuss about it? And also, if you could talk about your views on tariffs, the uh, the U.S. tariffs on on Chinese goods under the Section 301. Uh, what are you uh, telling your counterparts within the administration that we should do about these? Thank you. So. Um, with respect to China, um, certainly the lockdowns look like they are impeding the production and flow of goods and services, given how extensive they are, and compounding supply chain difficulties that we have had that have boosted prices, although some of those pressures seem to be mitigating um, the developments in China exacerbate those supply chain pressures. And so that's a source of concern. China also seems to be experiencing a slowdown in growth. And um, as one of the largest economies uh, in, the, in the globe, um, China's economic performance um, really has spillover impacts on growth all around the world. And so um, that that is a factor that affects the global outlook. And we're monitoring carefully what happens in what happens in China and what their policy responses are. With respect to tariffs, um, 
Discussions about tariffs are underway in the administration. Um, I've said previously that I think that some of the tariffs that were imposed um, by President Trump in retaliation for uh, China's um, unfair trade practices, some of them to me seem as though they impose more harm on consumers and businesses and aren't very strategic in the sense of um, addressing real issues we have with China, whether it concerns supply chain vulnerabilities, national security issues, um, or other unfair trade practices. And so I see a case um, not only because of inflation, but because there would be benefits to um, consumers and firms from some of the tariffs that some relief could come from cutting some of them. But we're, we're having these discussions. There are a variety of impacts. There are a variety of opinions. And um, we really haven't sorted out yet, come to agreement um, on where to, be, where to be on tariffs. And you know, I respect the um, opinions I, heard, I hear expressed around the policy table there are a variety of valid concerns. Hi, Secretary Yellen. Hi. I wanted to ask about uh, the exemption for the U.S. receiving payments on Russian sovereign debt that's due to expire, uh, I guess, next week. I'm curious how you're thinking about the decision of whether that exemption should be renewed and what you see as the possible economic impacts of uh, pushing Russia into default and yeah, what spillovers there could be from that move? So, um, you know, we when we first imposed sanctions on Russia, we created an exemption that would allow a period of time for an orderly transition to take place and for investors to be able to sell securities. And the expectation was that it was time-limited. So um, I think it's reasonably likely that the license will be allowed to expire. Um, I can't s there has not been a final decision on that, but I think it's unlikely that um, it would, um, you know, it, it would continue. Um, you know, in terms of Russia, Russia is um, not able right now to borrow in global financial markets. It has no access to capital markets. Um, if Russia is unable to find a legal way to make these payments and they technically default on their debt, um, I, I don't think that really represents a significant change in Russia's situation. They're already cut off from global capital markets and that would continue. Klaus Ulverscheid with Germany's uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Madam Secretary, are you concerned that the United States, Europe, and China might end up in some kind of synchronized recession like Ken Rogoff and other economists have um, predicted? Thank well, you. Well, I mean, I really, I really hope that doesn't happen. Um, you know, from the U.S. point of view, I, I would say that we have... Um, a great deal of mom economic momentum in the United States. We uh, probably re we recovered um, faster from the pandemic economically than almost any other country. And, you know, we have a very low, almost the lowest unemployment we've had um, in the post-war period, huge job creation, a very tight labor market, and households that are in overall excellent financial sh shape with substantial buffer stocks of um, resources that they can use to continue to spend. Um, you know, we have inflation. Obviously, the Fed is tightening monetary policy to address it. Um, and we are in a global environment where there are significant risks and pressures but I really don't expect the United States to fall into a recession. I think Europe is perhaps a bit more, a bit more vulnerable um, and, of course, more exposed on the energy front 
than the United States is. Um, I'm not going to make a forecast here, but, um, you know, this is a, an environment that is filled with risks, both with respect to inflation and also potential slowdowns. Thank you.